is a former news director of this radio station and also the former news director of what many of us for years knew as NBC 25 in Hagerstown. Mark Cram. Mark, uh, good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you guys. Also, those of you who have been longtime fans of the Rumsey Radio Hour also know Mr. Yes. Cram as part of that. Yeah, for, uh, well, what, uh, since 1991 I was part of that, and uh, it got mothballed uh, there in uh, 2020 due to COVID. Right. and. Uh, We've been uh, we're working on it that uh, we may we may bring back a show here sometime soon. A possible return. There you go. Yeah, yeah. We, we enjoyed uh, skewering politicians and uh, uh, having poking fun at uh, local things. And there's so. been so much rich material lately. It's a shame that you can't. <laughs> yeah, there's there's plenty to work with. Let me tell you. I think maybe you know maybe the maybe the real news is competing with the Rumsey Radio Hour. I don't know. You know come on. So. Do you, have, do you have any Bibles for sale today that you're hawking or anything? <laughs> yeah, or, right. Yeah. Nothing like that? Yeah, no, I don't think so. But no? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. work on that one, yeah, too. Yeah, there, there you go. Yeah. So, so I, the first question I'll ask you is uh, in regards to what happened to NBC25 uh, as a local TV well, news affiliate. There was a, That was an outlet for a lot of West Virginia news. Do you, do you want the long story or the uh, the, the abbreviated version? I'll, I'll, I'll skim over the high points. Uh, you mentioned NBC25. The station uh, was an NBC affiliate up until 2016. Mm -hmm. At that point in time, the, the NBC network and, and WHAG-TV parted ways. Uh, with that, the owner of uh, the company, which was uh, Perry Silk, owned uh, Nextdoor Broadcasting, still owns Nextdoor Broadcasting, uh, said, you know, for years we've stayed up in this western part of the, of the DMV, DMA, uh, the, the market area. And uh, but now there's no reason that we can't, you know, move further toward D.C. The reason we had stayed farther west was because we were an NBC station and not to compete with Channel 4 or vice versa. You wouldn't be allowed to. Right. And so anyway, once we were an independent, then uh, they expanded our news staff. We added uh, Montgomery County and we added uh, several counties in northern Virginia. Uh, so that was 2017-18. Uh, in 2019, Nexstar purchased the Tribune Broadcasting System, uh, including 30 stations, WGN, Chicago, uh, KTLA in Los Angeles, uh, um, WPHL in Philly. Uh, and so they added uh, quite a number, and they added uh, WDCW, Channel 50, in Washington. Um, so shortly after they, they bought that, they disclosed that they wanted to expand and add a news operation to Channel 50. Now, what's interesting is we, on the, over the last several years, the broadcasting industry, a lot of television stations have dried up their news. They, they stopped doing it. It just became too, too expensive, and, you know, it's, it's a big cost to do that. To Perry Sook's credit and Next Door Broadcasting's credit, they would buy properties and then add news. So it was, it was pretty pretty exciting really uh so they decided they were going to add a news operation in dc uh the building in dc was much larger than the building in hagerstown uh and so it, it didn't surprise us when they said we're bringing all the new to use the the cliche that's become our part of our vernacular state-of-the-art equipment uh that they were going to add to um in the dcw building but they were also going to move our station out of Hagerstown so that they're not replicating, buying two sets of gear of everything, put it all in one building, and uh, continue to operate uh, from Washington with uh, bureaus out here uh, and continuing to cover the area. And so that transition took place in 2022. Um, and so um, uh, last year they made some other adjustments and uh, – October, um, I faced either moving to D.C. and uh, or uh, uh, taking it out at uh, 30 years after being there, and uh, so I opted to, uh, to to step out, and I'm now working uh, doing public relations for a nonprofit in Frederick. No, we probably pass on the way in. Somewhere. I bet uh, is that you that flashes your lights? I think it, you know, uh, I think you come over here a little earlier than I go over there. We should just switch jobs. It would make so much more sense. Yeah, uh, maybe so. So are you, you're out of the news business entirely now? 
Uh, pretty much. I mean, I still keep my eyes peeled on what's going on locally, and mm -hmm. I still make my opinions known to the uh, elected officials and, and those that are, you know. One of my gripes was after they changed the railroad tracks down by the, uh, um, by the regional jail for about two months there they had this ramp that went up and then back down you guys familiar with that you know <laughs> yeah I, I thought seriously about changing the horn on my car to the the one that they used in the dukes of hazard you know so if, if you remember that <laughs> oh yeah you know? i was a regular viewer okay so anyway but i'm glad they finally figured out how to how to flatten that out a little bit uh -huh. you know? so very so, nice but i'm still a a, a uh, passport carrying member of the west virginia <laughs> <laughs> residency yeah and, and you were very involved with uh some national news organizations as well I, I well yeah over the years i well. mean uh at, at various points um back during my radio career i did quite a bit of work with abc radio i did filed some reports with um you remember when cnn had a radio oh yeah uh, radio broadcast and uh, also uh, with Net npr and you were the president of the RTDNA, too, were you not? I was chairman of the uh, RTDNA for three years. I served on their board for 18 years. And uh, so... And the RTDNA is what? The Radio Television Digital News Association. And it's the largest uh, organization of uh, electronic journalists in the world. Uh, principally, they um, uh, advocate the, uh, uh, you know, for the... Uh, First Amendment, and uh, to uh, also um, uh, basically support. They have a lot of uh, scholarships that they uh, offer to young people getting into the business. Now, I want to I bring you around to some news themes here, and, and one of which is that uh, news people have an agenda. News people are all liberal, and they, they all uh, are against Donald Trump. And they all pull for the liberal to win in elections. And they, they, as a result, their, their stories are very biased. I do? No. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, th this, this point of an agenda, uh, I will say that my observation is, certainly in the local news markets, um, in small market radio, small, small market television, uh, you have a group of individuals, basically, they just want to get the information out to the public that protects the public, informs the public, uh, makes them better citizens so they know what's going on in their community. Uh, in regards to networks, I, I think it's obvious, fairly obvious, that certain networks lean one way or the other, or maybe more than lean, they absolutely live there, you know. But uh, for local news, uh, if, if you think you see an opinion, it's probably a young journalist, a young inexperienced journalist, who forms in their mind that they need to advocate one way or another, or uh, they decide going in that, well, he's the bad guy and she's the good, good person, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that skews the, the, the views sometimes. Um, I am alarmed at what I see in regards to uh, writing uh, and, uh, and opinion creeping in when it shouldn't. In the broadcast world, what is the broadcast equivalent of the city desk editor, who's the one that is supposed to take that out of those stories? Well, you have the assignment editor, which, which assigns out the, uh, the, the news story, but the producers are the ones that get the uh, information after. When the reporter brings it back in, then a producer is putting it together. They're stacking So it isn't that second time. level also missing? If we have the young reporter who, who lets that opinion dominate the report, there's somebody else dropping a ball. So right? absolutely. And w what we found is, um, and, and we could talk all day about the, the, the checking out of, uh, of the workforce, the, the people who, who don't want to go to work anymore. And uh, what news management found is that the producers uh, became an endangered species. You couldn't find them anymore. Someone who had experience, three to five years experience would be desirable to bring into your newsroom. You plop them down in a chair and let them have at that copy. It's, it's going to come out better than it went in. 
across the board, and I'm not just talking about small market, I'm talking about Washington and New York and Los Angeles and Chicago. I talk to news director colleagues of mine who are hiring people one year experience, maybe right out of college with the same level of experience that that reporter brings in. Now here you go, no one's, no one's watching the, the copy, it just gets through. You know, it, it's just like I was reading a story the other day from CNN, and throughout this story, it was talking about the steel trust that collapsed, T-R-U-S-T, oh, Lord. that collapsed when the ship hit the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And I, I, I looked and I was like, well, and I even went to look up the word trust just to make sure because some words have changed meanings mm -hmm. during my lifetime. I, I thought it took like a thousand years for a word to change meaning. It seems like it takes five minutes anymore. But uh, no, this reporter at a national level is referring to a steel trust and uh maybe he was confusing joist and truss i think he was and merged the words truss yeah he wanted yeah. to say trust t-r-u-s-s -S, so that's still trust no and it added a t on it mark you you've raised the uh the key bridge uh i i was taken aback i'm taken aback how quickly so many folks in the in the media news media as well as people you talk to automatically default to a conspiracy it was all done intentionally to destroy the economy or to pat, uh, show blame on the, uh, the, the government leadership. Whatever yeah, the case may be. I mean, and, and the other thing that, 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 you know, again, was aggravating for me to see is the what ifs, the rabbit yeah. holes. Uh, well, you know, there, there could be, you know, uh, 50 cars down there. And there could be hundreds of people, and there could be this, and there could, you know, and I, I used to tell some of my reporters, I'd say, you can what if yourself to death, you know, because there's all sorts of possibilities, but none of them are viable. But the moment, the moment that reporter is standing there looking in the camera and says, well, what if, yeah. somebody in the public takes that not not as a conjecture, not as a uh, you know a possibility, but they take it that it's happened. It's, yeah, it's been and unfortunately, case. what they should have done is to uh, go to what's the most reasonable cause of the problem. Right. And we talked a little bit about this on air last week uh, that the uh, currents mm -hmm. uh, are strong in that area. The ship is not, is not very maneuverable. Right. Uh, it works best on a straight line. Uh, if you had a power failure, which it did, and they said possibly due to fuel, bad fuel, which had nothing to do with the pilot, uh, but bad fuel, and if you're all, if you did not have engines working for as short as five or six minutes, you'd never be able to recover. Right. So uh, it's all a logical chain of events of what could have happened without invoking the conspiracy. Well, having grown up in Baltimore, that channel is not very wide. It's yet. not, no. And uh, so, you know, to drift off of it there, uh, you know, and, but yeah, I, I watched a variety of different, I, I definitely was surfing around to see who had to say what. Um, and, uh, you know, it just, uh, overall, just yeah. the feeling that you couldn't believe. In fact, I woke up that morning, I had to uh, run to the airport there very early, so I got up uh, before four o'clock, and, uh, uh, a friend of mine who works in the in the television business, and she's currently in Arizona, and she had posted a photo and reminisced back to when she worked at WBAL in Baltimore, and she said, you know, the key bridge fell this morning. And the way she wrote it, I was like, she shouldn't have said it that way. That sounds like the whole bridge fell. And then I saw that it had. Yeah. yeah. Because I was sure that certainly it must have been just a small segment. I, I, I couldn't believe it. Well, the net effect of this, and I think the genie's out of the bottle, that um, the entire model of news has changed. When I was a kid, we, you know, the news came on at six or whatever time it, it, that, that we watched. We had the local news and then and we had the, the national news. And the papers came out in the morning, they came in in the evening, and everything else was sort of a desert. 
Now it's this constant flow and the beast has to be fed. Uh, the constant in journalism going way, way back to forever is you're trying to scoop the competition. Right. Right. So th that's not that's not going to change. Um, it's unfortunate, I think. And now it's a stream of consciousness thing. What used to just be a question to be asked now is conjecture that's asked aloud in the form of an ongoing mm -hmm. news story. Yeah. And what I think the net effect is nobody trusts anything. Anymore. Right. Well, no, I, I think you're right. And, you know, you mentioned the, the RTDNA that I was a, a I'm still a member of it, a, on the board there for so many years. And, and one of the things that they advocate is get it right don't get it first you know get it right and and they just in practice it doesn't it's not happening mark let's go back to the small media stations mm -hmm. television or radio is there a place in our society for a small station that uh that primarily concentrates on local news you have your streaming you have your social media between these a lot of the local news is captured do you see a future for the small station? Well, it's interesting. I think the success of stations like this and and, and others uh, indicates, you know, that that there is a desire. But the other thing is, who is the consumer? Who is the end consumer? And you know, so how many people are tuned in to a particular channel or a particular frequency versus picking this thing up? Yeah. Um, for you, you out there in Radio Land, I'm holding my phone. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and then, I mean, you've added the TV element here, you know, with the, with the cable and and you know. But again, um, I'm assuming. Do you uh, do you stream this program? This goes live to Facebook, and when we do a high school game or a shepherd game, that goes live to YouTube. Okay. So, uh, I mean, so there you go. Um, you know, I think there's probably a lot of end users that are, that are picking it up that way as well. What, it, what the future holds, I wish I knew. Uh, it sure has changed a lot in the last five to 10 years. Changed a lot from when I first got in 40 years ago already when I began broadcast, working in broadcast. And um, it, it's going to change more. I what? think there were... You, just building on a point you had there, John, there are two seminal developments in this business since I graduated from college that have changed the way this business operates. One is CNN 24-hour news. Correct. Because when you do 24-hour news, you have to fill it with something. And when you have to fill it with something, this is where we get into conjecture and opinion and, and then flat out making stuff up because you got to fill time. And then the second part of that is social media, because what social media did was uh, if you, Mark, like I, I'm 61. I don't know what your age is, but we I'm were a little older. Than we, were, we, were <laughs> we were trained in an era that you got two confirmations yeah. before you went on the air with something. And it didn't matter how important it was. If you didn't get that second confirmation, you didn't go on the air with it. Social media changed that to it's no longer about two confirmations. It's about blurting it out first, and it right. doesn't matter if it's accurate or not. And that has changed Or if news. it's defamatory or, uh, you know, uh, certainly, uh, you know, any of those things. And what I found oftentimes, we would go out on stories and somebody would take us to task and say, why didn't you talk about X, Y, and Z? Because we cannot confirm X, Y, and Z. I mean, it's like, you know, it, it's like, Bill, you mentioned about, about the, the, the conspiracy. You know, well, there was a person who came here and, you know, and they blew this up, you know. Why aren't you reporting that? Because we can't confirm it. It's not legitimate news. And it's more pernicious than that because once, once your agency reports the, the fallacy, then my agency can report the fact of your reportage, you know, the fact the, can report on your story, and I can do it free and clear because yes. I am reporting a hard fact that you reported this. And this is now what reporting has has become. It kind of, it, it, it they, they feed on each other. Yeah. It's madness. And they don't look at it. You know, uh, oftentimes when I go to schools and speak to students, I would always start out saying, do you know you're a reporter. And they're like, no, no, I'm not. Oh, well, yeah, yes, you are. When you, when you come in this morning, you know, did you tell what you did over the weekend? 
as you were riding in on the bus, you get here and you go, oh, man, we saw an accident. I said, you're reporters. And, and you continue to be reporters on the social media. When you send a, a text to your buddy and tell him Martinsburg won the game, you're a reporter, you know. But I, the general public does not look at it as being, it's just, it's just talk over the backyard fence is all it is in their minds. You know, it's not, it's not, let's be careful. Let's not cause panic. All the things that responsible broadcasters are thinking about, including the thought that you may be sued, you know, for, for whatever you publish. Um, Mark, a, a future of any business, any organization is in large part directed by the feeding group coming up, the young mm -hmm. folks coming mm -hmm. in, get the start, the hard knocks and learn the lesson. Are we finding a lot of young folks going into journalism or going into TV uh, uh, news production? Not as many as there once was. Yeah. Um, I will say in the 90s and even into the 2000, 2008, 9, 10, um, Especially during the period, I, I remember this vividly, when, when individuals would send you a VHS tape. They'd put their audition on a VHS tape, attach a, uh, a resume, paper resume with it, and mail it to you. I literally had stacks and stacks, hundreds, hundreds of VHS tapes in my office waiting for me to go through them as I needed another reporter. And that was the case in every television newsroom as I talked to my colleagues across the country that was the case and then it began to wane and until finally the last couple of years you would wait for months to get an acceptable resume which would come in electronically they would attach it to an email you know and you'd click on it and watch it and you know you would look for writing samples or the writing style uh, there were those who uh, plagiarized or stole someone else's material. I caught a person doing that one time. I said, "How much of this vit, this tape, or, you know, your your demo reel? We called it and using the old terms demo reel, but it was still now it's electronic. Uh, how much of your demo reel did you shoot and write and edit yourself?" And this person got very mad, angry that uh, why would you ask that question? Well, then I found out later none of the material was, was theirs. It, it was all stolen. And uh, Appreciate you not mentioning my name on the <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you got it. So uh, You're a good man? Yeah, well, you know. Well, you know, we've, we've discussed this off the air a, a lot of times. I, I was addicted to radio during my teen years. I grew up in the D.C. area. So I was part of the morning zoo thing. Sure. You know, that, that era. And the, the homogenous... Harden and Weaver in D.C. I in grew morning. up on Harden and yeah, Weaver. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All they did was read the time and the weather. That's oh, really yeah. all oh, they did, yeah. an occasional voice here and there. I've got some great stories, I'll tell you off mic. But the, <laughs> the, the homogenization of, of radio has taken so much personality and texture out of, oh, yeah. of America, really. You could go driving across. We're listening late at night mm -hmm. on AM stations. We're bouncing in from wherever they're, oh, yeah. they're bouncing You're in from. Listening to Cousin Brucey from WABC. And I'm no, just hoping that the pendulum will somehow swing Larry back. Glick. I don't know how it pays for itself. But, well, that's but the thing. Be... So many radio stations, especially the smaller radio stations that couldn't turn a profit... Uh, they they click onto the satellite and they stream it in and there's nobody there 24 seven, nobody in the building. You know, it's it's basically a, it could be a shack out in the middle of a field somewhere and you have a satellite dish and retransmit it out. And, and so what I have to say is kudos to to the to the individuals who who keep local radio on because you know it's. It's tough. It's not easy. Mark, final question for you comes from our audience, and that is, do you think AI will ultimately replace news media? Well, <laughs> that's interesting. You know, the Associated Press and the RTDNA have already come out with uh, uh, expressions of, you know, what is acceptable in, in regards to AI. And most newsrooms across the nation also have a, um, a policy that um, – you are not going to 
process the facts through AI. We want you to write it yourself. Um, AI can uh, certainly, it's amazing, uh, you know, as I've seen individuals, you know, experiment with it, uh, what it does, and I think there's going to be a greater usage of it. Um, it, It's kind of scary to think that that you're even going to take the human out of of your news and it's just going to be a computer spitting it out to you, you know? I guess Rosie from the Jetsons has a great career in broadcasting. Okay? <laughs> There's a deep dive. <laughs> you have to be over a certain age to understand that what I just said. His boy Elroy. Right. <laughs> hey, that was a great show, man. Was look, the- look it up on the. Uh, you can find it somewhere on Roku. I'm sure. You had the Flintstones on at one end of the spectrum and the Jetsons at the other. All right. I don't know how much time you got, but I tell I'll you a quick a story. Yeah. Right, okay, about the, about the Flintstones. So. One time I was editing some video in the newsroom and um, this reporter walked by and I said, you know, this old car here, I said, it reminds me of my first car. And the reporter said, you had cars back then? And I said, well, yeah, of course. I mean, you know, they, they were primitive. They were like the cars in the Flintstones. They weren't as advanced as they are now. And she goes, what are the Flintstones? <laughs> You're fired. (laughs) I'll send you out on the Jetsons theme, Mark Cram. Thank you. Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you. 